Would you please stand? Thank you. Would you please be seated? Well, first of all, on behalf of uh, I know um, John, the family, uh, a big thank you to everyone for being here as we come together to remember and give thanks for Alison. Uh, people have travelled a distance, some from the locality, I know others from uh, much further afield. And I think the very fact that this church of St Mary's is um, full, uh, just the fact that there's just so many people here, is a recognition of the love of which Alison was held. I don't think any of us would have wanted to be here today on the circumstances that we meet. And the last two years have obviously been very hard. But I think one thing we do do is we come in solidarity. We're here with uh, John, with uh, Jack and Harriet and uh, all the family. And 
it is a sense of showing just how much we care and are with you. Well, when we have the order of service and when the discussions with Peter are sort of bringing it together, um, there are a few sort of uh, little hints about Alison's character. Um, she was a very organized person, a list person. And at the back of the order of service, there's a list of uh, Alison's uh, favorite things. And uh, we've had Matt Monroe as we come in, came in. We have in brackets, you would see, genius. And then there's also um, favorite place in the world. And the answer is North Church. And there's something about belonging and having a sense of home and where you come from and where your roots are. And I think this church sort of uh, reflects that in its own way with the generations who have uh, been here over, well, the many years that this church has been built. But as we come, and as I said, people have traveled a distance, um, there is a request as we leave the church or maybe over in the parish room. Um, there is a book at the back and if you could write your name um, just to say that you have been at this service, that would be greatly appreciated by the family. So they have a, an idea of the number of people who have come together to celebrate her life. Alison wrote various uh, things and she had maybe with a sense of foresight this day in mind. Uh, one of the requests she made was for donations. Um, the Children's Hospice Southwest and there is a sort of um, ways you can do that on the order of service. And in a way of thinking about others, going through what she was going, going through, she wanted to focus on children and young people who are going through, well, just the pain and anguish that it brings and for their families as well. So donations are there. But also this is something that she wrote. And in one sense, it seems very hard to say it because we are sad and this seems too early. But these are Alison's words. Don't be sad for me. I have been truly blessed in life. Wonderful parents, brothers, husband, children and friends. Truly, truly blessed. How lucky. If you please stand, if you are able, we'll sing together the first hymn, Morning Has Broken.
If you would, again, please be seated. I'm going to ask uh, Colin if he would come forward and he would give the eulogy. We're in this lovely church because, of course, Alison was a North Church girl. She was born in 1963, the third child of Jack and Joan Pales. And her formative years were spent at the Meads, close by, with her brothers Peter, Nicholas and Andrew. At five, she began at North Church Primary School, just like generations of her family before her. She loved the village school and the friends she began to make. She even liked Miss Pickles, a strict disciplinarian and not everyone's cup of tea. However, one teacher stood out from the rest, a kindly Mr. Richardson, and she remained in touch with him and even visited him at his home in Scotland until his death just a few years ago. Alison loved sports. All four children loved sports. And with three brothers to compete with, and a bit of green in the Meads, where many a cup final and test match were played out, she became a match even for them. She had a left foot that Lionel Messi or Maradona would have been pleased to own. And Nick recalls that almost entirely on that trusty left foot, she could do keepy-uppers, which were the envy of us all. At nine years old and still honing these skills, she moved on to the Thomas Bourne Middle School. And at some point, Mr. Parr selected her for the boys' team. But, and I quote, Mum somehow found out and hoiked me out. I'm not having a daughter of mine in the boys' football team. How times have changed. But it wasn't all about sport. In fact, her talents knew no bounds. At a very young age, Alison would annoy and bemuse in equal measure as she whistled the entire theme tune to the Virginian as we all sat down to watch. And she would later sing in Mrs. Sorder's girls' choir in this very church. She won a chopper bicycle in a national drawing competition and her design of a linked hands logo was adopted by the church youth group, Lynx, which she happily attended. No surprise then that she gained an A-level for her portfolio of furniture illustrations some years later. Alison enjoyed school and excelled at most things there. At Thomas Bourne, she was awarded the accolade of Bourne Scholar and invested as such in a ceremony at St. Peter's Church in Berkhamsted, coincidentally on her 13th birthday. Andrew suggests it was for being an all-round good egg. He should know. He was honoured himself two years later. In September 1977, Alison moved on to Ashland's school, continuing to excel academically and in sport. She played goal attack 
and captained the netball team. And her hockey team became school county champions under the tutelage of Miss Lobbin. And in summer 1979, she was awarded the Victrix Ludorum Trophy for athletics. And on close inspection of the names of previous winners, she discovered one Joan Cutler, 1939. It was her mother. Throughout her school life and from there on, Alison formed friendships that would last her lifetime. Unsurprisingly, sport was at the forefront of her mind when she chose to do a sports degree at Chichester University's Bishop Otter College in Sussex. But also by now she had set her heart on a career in the police force. And in 1986, she duly joined the constabulary at Watford as a uniformed beat officer. A change of role ensued to that of a response car driver, which required advanced driver training. Her ability behind the wheel was described recently as fearless. But as much as the daring do of life in the police force had excited her to begin with, seeing the seedier side of life and the sad ways some people live their lives gradually took its toll. And so she moved to the forces operations room. As we know, Alison met her future husband, John, while working. And in 2001, she left the force when John himself retired from it. They married in Penzance and made their home there. Those present at the wedding will remember her radiance, wearing the Edwardian dress and hat from a period of history she so loved. They had two children, Jack and Harriet, whom she adored. She surrounded herself and them with an astonishing array of artwork, ornaments, books, and other artifacts that she loved collecting. She was quite the curator. But it should also be said that by her own admission, technology and cooking were not her strong points. Scientific knowledge for practical purposes confounded and frustrated her, but she got by. As for her culinary expertise, she delighted in telling anyone who listened that Aunt Bessie was her favorite aunt. But you never got a bad meal from her, even if, or perhaps because, there was a heavy dependence on casserole dishes. While she and John immersed themselves in watching the children grow up with regular trips to the beach, a feature, and keeping an eye on elderly neighbours, North Church was never really far from her mind. She retained happy memories of walking on the common on a sun summer's evening with all the family and their dog, Jess. She loved the flora and fauna of home. <coughs> Nevertheless, they all lived very happily in Alexandra Gardens until the devastating news of her diagnosis in <coughs> August 2020. Life for them was never going to be the same again, but they adapted, and they and the extended family and all her friends enveloped Alison with all the love and care they could muster until she died on the 31st of December. On her final visit to North Church last November, she made sure that she visited with Peter 
the grave of her parents. Only four years earlier, she had been instrumental in organizing the funeral of her mother. As she stood at the foot of the grave with its modest headstone, she turned to Peter and said, we got it right, Peter, didn't we? So we like to think that this is how she will be remembered, always putting others before herself. She wanted us to remember her as a control freak, a list lady, and to quote her again, a stick of rock with North Church running through me. Like all of us, she may not have been perfect, but she was the next best thing. incentive for signing your name when you leave because there is a stick of rock and uh, it does have a heart and uh, North Church going right through the centre and uh, I know a friend is going to be um, sort of arranging that when we leave the church. We have two readings. Um, the first is the poem Leisure and it's going to be read by Tim who is um, Alison's godson. Leisure by W. H. Davis. What is this life, if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare? No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep and cows. No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight, streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet, how they dance. No time to wait till her mouth can enrich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. second reading picks up again on that theme and it's the silent maker how silently God makes each lovely thing no beat of drum no startling trumpet blare one might expect a heavenly choir to sing seeing there is such beauty everywhere but not a sound, nothing to let me know that I, this morning, would come face to face with Lady Iris, all a purple glow, a queenly iris of exquisite grace, lilacs in bloom. It takes one's breath away to come upon such beauty unaware. I heard no sound but suddenly today, I smell their perfume in the morning air. So very lovely is the world, just now since God within the quiet watches of the night has kissed his meadows, and each waiting bough and brought forth blossoms for our deep delight. I wonder, it is but a passing thought if God works silently these fruitful days 
to show what deeds of worth and beauty can be wrought in unassuming, gentle, silent ways. Please stand. We're sing together from the order of service. <laughs> Abide with me. Would you please be seated? We come to that point in the service for the prayers, and uh, and in saying these prayers, very mindful of the family connections over the generations with this church of St Mary's, and the first is a prayer of thanksgiving. 
God our Father. We thank you that you have made each of us in your own image and given us gifts and talents with which to serve you. And we thank you now for Alison, for the years that we shared with her, for the memories that we have, the love that has been given and the love that we have received. Now give us strength and courage to leave her in your care, holding to your promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and if we please turn to the order of service and we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life, until the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last through Christ our Lord. sing together our final hymn and it's the day thou gavest Lord is ended again would you please stand <laughs>
have come to the close of the service in St. Mary's and we're going to have a very sort of intimate um, sort of a service of uh, burial in New Road Cemetery with the close family. Um, but please make your way over to the parish room for refreshments and you'll be very soon be able to uh, uh, be with the family again when they come back from New Road. But likewise, if anyone would like to go up to the cemetery a little bit later, they are more than welcome. And if anyone's unsure of where it is, please, please ask and we can give directions. But I'm going to close with a prayer that maybe just sort of picks up on some of the themes. I mean, nature, the uh, beauty of this locality was so important to Alison. And this is a prayer from sort of a Celtic daily prayer, which sort of uh, has its origins in sort of uh, the Irish monks of uh, Iona and Lindisfarne. But it picks up on that theme. The sun and the stars, the valleys and the hills, the rivers and the lakes all disclose your presence. The roaring breakers of the sea tell of your awesome might. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air proclaim your wondrous will. In your goodness, you have made us able to hear the music of the world and the voice of loved ones reveal to us that you are in our midst. A divine song sings through all creation. So may the holy and life-giving God teach us a reverence for all his works that we may praise him in all that we do and share in his work of creation and live to his glory.